Welcome. This is The Sages. My name is Benjamin Akakbo, and um, we've taken upon ourselves this project to talk to those luminaries, intellectuals across the continent of Africa, to gauge their pulse, their thoughts on myriad issues, but also to create an archive of their thoughts to shape the future. And that's why we have these conversations. Today, I'm going to be engaging a man who is an author, he is a legal luminary, he is an agent of development, and he's a man who's written a ton of books, 18 of them. His research papers are numerous, and he is a professor emeritus. He's Tanzanian. In case you're wondering of whom I speak, well, I'm going to put you out of your misery because he's a pretty prominent figure, not just in Tanzania, but across Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Issa Ghulam Hussein Shifji. He is our guest on The Sages today. Prof, and I think it's Thank only you. fitting to say Professor Emeritus, uh, it's good to have you join the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. This is a good opportunity for you. I'm honored to appear in this series, although I do not probably consider myself to be one of the sages, but I can <laughs> make a small contribution uh, to, to the series. Well, so thank you very much for giving this opportunity. Well, we thank you. And modesty has always been the hallmark of great people. So um, <laughs> it's good to have you join the conversation. Let, let's start off with who you are. I'm sure if anyone were to key in your name in Google, they would get quite a, a, detail, a detailed account of who you are. But we'd like to hear from you who is Emeritus Professor uh, Shivji. Where were you born? What kind of family uh, did you grow up in? What was it like? Just tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, very briefly, um, I was born uh, in Kilosa, a small town in the eastern region of uh, then colonial Tanganyika. And uh, I studied in Kilosa. I did my primary school education, which was then eight years. And then in 1961, I started my secondary school in Dar es Salaam and also did my high school. See, I was born in a relatively poor family of uh, small shopkeepers. Uh, who never made their ends meet. But both my parents were extremely keen on educating their children. And they put particular premium, as things went at that time, on the education of the boy child. Because in our family, we were three, we were five actually, but two died in the infancy. So we remained three siblings, uh, two sisters and myself. So I made it to university education, did my bachelor in laws at that, at that time, the University of East Africa, University College of Dar es Salaam, mm. as part of East Africa. I completed that in 1970, joined the faculty of law, as teacher assistant, then did one year of master's at London School of Economics, and then did my PhD at the University of Dar es Salaam. I retired formally at the age of 16 in 2006, but later on in 2008, I was invited to be the first uh, uh, Malibuyare professorial chair in Pan African Studies which I did for five years. And during that time that we organized every year Malibu Jarere intellectual festivals to which I invited uh, many African uh, intellectuals, but also uh, freedom fighters. And I think that was a great joy for our young people to see the people who had fought for our independence in uh, in flesh and blood. And we had very vigorous discussions. It did provide an excellent platform 
for people to reflect for three, four, five days. So that was for five years. And after I completed my term there, I started uh, the Nere Resource Center at the Tanzania Commission for uh, Science and Technology. Mm. And uh, that I did for five years, where we archived the works of Mwalimi Yerere, but also had regular discussions on his thought. Uh, not just discussions as narratives and uh, uh, praising, but very critical discussions. There was another platform which provided young people to know more about their history, to, more, to know more about the, uh, the first generation of nationalists under Mwalimi Yerere. I see. Interesting thoughts and interesting background. I am curious, though, why law? I know you've been an advocate for justice and all of that. You could have read any other subject. Why did you pursue a program in law? That's an interesting question. And at the time, probably I did not give many much thought. But when looking backwards, you know, I was a science student in high school. I see. I did, yes, I did physics, chemistry, applied mathematics, and pure mathematics. And I was probably the first science student to go into arts, that is law. Why law? Well, as you have probably mentioned, it is that I thought that is where uh, I could but probably make my contribution uh, for, for, for justice for the, for the ordinary folks. Uh, but also since doing law, I realized that uh, law and justice are not the same thing. Uh, you can have legality without there being justice. But that is a later development at the University of Dar es Salaam. But I think that was the original uh, intention and original uh, push for me to do law. Interesting thoughts. Later I'll come to leadership, but I'd like to start from the fact that indeed your name is synonymous with liberation, emancipation, and like I just mentioned, um, justice as well. Now, why do you feel these have been so ingrained in you right from your infant years? What is it? Was it the colonial period? Uh, was it, and I'm talking generally across the continent, what was it that triggered these sentiments in you growing up? Again, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Actually, my background, I mean, as, as growing up as, as, as a young boy, and later I found out that there was too many of my comrades at the university. My background was actually, I grew up in a very religious atmosphere. I you know, that was my background. But always questioned some very basic principles. Because... Uh, while I grew up in religious atmosphere and imbibed various principles, one thing that I always questioned in my own uh, naive younger days was why did religion discriminate among co-religionists and those who did not belong to the religion? And that I could never explain. And that's one thing which I think pushed me to look beyond religion. And what was when that? I came to the university, it provided the opportunity now. Because, you know, we were first generation post Arusha declaration at the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, because I joined the university in 1967. Uh, I think it was, it, was, it, was, it was March or no, July. And the Arusha declaration was uh, declared, was adopted in February 1967. So Arusha Declaration provided the atmosphere for, figure, for vigorous debates on campus. The whole question about socialism. Because one thing the Arusha Declaration did was to open up discussion on socialism. Okay? So that was an opportunity where uh, we discussed a lot, debated a lot, and interacted with many very leading African intellectuals, for example, uh, our organization, which was called University of Students African Revolutionary Front, invited people like uh, C.L.I. James, Sokli Carmichael, Miriam Makeba, and freedom fighters based 
in Dar es Salaam to come and interact with us. So those were excellent opportunities. Mm. And in our course, both outside and inside the classroom, we read Franz Fanon, we read Kwame Nkrumah, we read Marx and Engels, we had read Sela James, his, his, his fantastic book, The Black Jacobins, and so on. So that really exposed the young people. Okay? And we were also involved in struggle. For example, one of our struggles was against compartmentalization of knowledge. We believed knowledge is whole. Okay? And therefore, we, we fought for what we would now call interdisciplinary education. And we even managed to establish courses which across the disciplines, uh, applying to all students, regardless of the disciplines, to discuss the, 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 our societies, uh, how they are, what they are, uh, where they are going, and what are the social forces in our society. So this was a time of great debates. Now, that was the domestic atmosphere. But you will recall that there was also an international upsurge in revolutionary thought all over the world. We had the civil rights movement in the U.S. We had the anti-Vietnam demonstrations all over the world, particularly in Europe. We had the Vietnam struggle, Vietnamese struggle against American imperialism. We had the Cultural Revolution in China. Mm. All these really opened up lots of spaces. And this was what Samir Amin might call the climax of the revolution during the 60s, 70s, 80s, and part of 90s before neoliberalism set in. So that, that is the atmosphere and those are the struggles, student struggles from which, in which I, I grew and which I imbibed uh, the values that I uh, since tried to uphold. And all of these obviously have shaped you, your thinking and your writing as well. And, and that dovetails into this bit about intellectuals or academics being revolutionary to a certain extent. You believe in revolutionary intellectualism. Uh, being an academic must have a purpose beyond being in the classrooms and doing research work. The question is why? That's correct. That's correct. And that's one thing we always questioned. We believe that uh, intellectuals have a particular role in society. And uh, they should always recall that uh, the spaces that they've been provided is actually at the expense of the sweat of uh, workers and peasants. Uh, it is at their sweat which has enabled you to, 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 be, to be in the position that you are in. And we are, in a sense, I mean, when I say I, we, I mean the academics and the intellectuals, are in a very privileged position in Africa. Because we are being paid and we are being sustained just to do one thing, to think. Mm -hmm. okay? And that is why it is important that we don't simply think, but give back to society uh, 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 our thoughts and act as a mirror on our society. Right. What the good, bad, and the ugly of the society and of the ruling powers. That's our, that's our, that's our, that's our uh, whole rise of the of, of existence. And that is what I've stuck to all my life. Although on the way, as it all, always happens, and there's nothing to regret about, is people fall out and they join the establishment, others uh, change their uh, ideological orientation, etc., etc. But some stick out, some stick out. And uh, modestly, I can say that I've tried to continue with those principles which I imbibed during those days. And staying there for a moment, talking about intellectualism, academic uh, prowess, and how it can be brought to bear in developing Africa. You have taught in, you have lectured in many different universities uh, across the world. And um, you look at the state of scholarship on the continent. Is it delivering what Africa needs so that it can spur on development. I mean, there are so many universities across the continent, but are they serving their purpose in this specific regard? And do you feel scholarship is facing a spiral? Is it on the decline? 
Yes, uh, I think I think the, the the period of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when our university started, the African campuses, not all, but many, particularly in Nigeria, for example, uh, 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 were very radical places, where there was a lot of very good scholarship. It was not simply ideological, but even in scholarly terms, it was excellent scholarship produced. But it was not a scholarship which was mesmerized by the so-called uh, neutrality. Okay? While we believed in objective research, we, believed, we did not believe in neutrality. You can't be neutral so far as the plight of our people is concerned. So there was a whole movement on African campuses. But uh, it seems to me that uh, over the last two or three decades, since we, across the continent, uh, embraced neoliberalism. Our universities have also been neoliberalized. Okay? And they have become a kind of place of, uh, of, 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 as if it was a factory to produce certain products and branded them so that uh, uh, young fellows get, get jobs, etc. And that has destroyed the primary purpose of the university, which is to produce knowledge and which is to produce debates, okay? and which is to give back objective uh, appreciation of their own societies. I think over the last two, three decades, we have really failed in that. And your know, scholarship, from the point of view of purely excellence, has really gone down. Mm. And one of the things that came with neoliberalism was two things, actually. One was the consultancy syndrome. And consultants, you don't really do good research. You do not do basic research. You do what the clients want you to. So you did reports. And that destroyed, that contributed to destroying scholarship. And two was the whole NGO syndrome, where because of the crisis of resources of universities, many of our uh, staff and academics left the university and joined the NGOs, which are funded by foreign foreign powers. Again, NGOs doesn't allow you to think much. They always talk you, tell you to act, not to think. Okay? So the funders told us to act. And they said, you act, we will do the thinking for you. And the NGO syndrome is another factor which has destroyed scholarship and real intellectual work. I think neoliberalism had a lot to do with it. But after all, universities don't exist in the vacuum. They exist to part of society. Okay? And so when these changes took place, in my university, for example, there were deliberate moves to change the orientation of the university and the so-called transforming the university. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's curious uh, some have said that, well, intellectualism on the, on the continent of Africa has yielded results, maybe not, not as much as in previous decades. And, and that is something you're echoing right now. But feeding into that, there is that Pan-African element. You've already mentioned uh, the likes of Kwame Nkrumah. And there's a group, Koresria, which you have been a long-time member of which is a pillar of Pan-Africanism. Tell us a bit about this group and what it really stands for. Are you still a member? Uh, and and what, what, is, what is the drive in terms of the Pan-Africanist agenda? Yes, I'm still a member. I'm still a member. Uh, you know, and, and uh, of recent, I've been writing quite a bit on Pan-Africanism. You see, in, in, in Africa, I think when you look back, one thing that you should keep in mind, that African nationalism, when I say national, I mean the territorial nationalism, which drove the struggle for independence, was born of part Africanism, not the other way around. The first generation leaders, nationalist leaders, all of the pan Africans including people like Hastings Banda, Albert Luthori, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kayata, and so on. 
So it's pan-Africanism which gave birth to nationalism, not the other way around. And therefore, when you talk about pan-African unity and pan-African struggles, we should always keep that in mind. But soon after independence, we found that those who came to power, okay, now wanted to consolidate their rule. So pan-Africanism was put to the back burner. And they began to beat the drums of territorial nationalism, narrow nationalism. And inevitably, in many countries, not in all, but in many countries, narrow nationalism degenerated into even ethnicism, racism, and so on. Because the ruling powers wanted to uh, 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 consolidate their power. And worse, this was exploited by the imperialist powers. Okay, to keep the continent divided, but also to ensure that these countries cannot unitedly face their power. So people like Kwame Nkrumah, for example, Kwame Nkrumah was over in 1966 in a CIA, CIA plot. It's, it's very clear. And he was not the only one. In fact, most progressive leaders were overthrown in, in military coups. Okay. So, I mean, that is, we have to keep in mind. But, but, and I think on a positive note, Pan-Africanism has refused to go away. The Pan-Africanism sentiment is very strong in Africa and across the generation. That's what I have found. When we talk today to young people about Pan-Africanism, it has its, re its resonance. It strikes a chord. I remember some years ago, I was invited to give the Bill Dudley lecture in Nigeria. And I was giving this lecture in Suka, I think. And as usual in Nigeria, we were about three hours late. Hmm. But the hall was full of over a thousand people. No one left. And it was full of young people from different universities. Hmm. They were waiting to hear about Pan-Africanism. So I think that is important to keep in mind. And I believe that now time has come to revive not only the spirit, but to revive the Pan-Africanist thought and Pan-Africanist movement. Except that this time around, it should be people-centric Pan-Africanism, not state-centric Pan-Africanism. And that debate is on. And you may have seen it in uh, pages of Codesia uh, journals and bulletins. There is, again, once again, beginning of the discussion on Pan-Africanism. And that's a discussion that I believe we should keep on and that Pan-Africanist discourse should be brought back in the, in the public domain. Let's stay a bit on Pan-Africanism. You are the first professor of Pan-Africanism at the University of Dar es Salaam. When you look at Pan-Africanism today, you say that is what even birthed nationalism on the continent of Africa. But is Pan-Africanism in crisis vis-a-vis -vis the events happening um, and the, the sort of leadership that we've had on the continent? You've already mentioned uh, Nkrumah, Kenyatta, and the likes. I would add Nyerere, Julius Nyerere. I would add Patrice yes. Lumumba. And we can go deep even into the 90s and add Nelson Mandela and all of these. But you look at the last three to four decades, and you even contemplate, for example, happenings in Kenya. And you ask yourself, is the Pan-African torch still burning? Your take. Good. Uh, 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 let, me, let me start with uh, uh, one speech of Marimu Yarele that he made in 1968, I think when he was, he was invited to inaugurate the University of Zambia. And he made a speech whose title was The Dilemma of a Pan-Africanist. Mm. And what was the dilemma of a Pan-Africanist? His basic argument was that, look, we all, or many of us, not all, many of us feel that Pan-Africanism is our future. But we are the leaders of countries. We have to state. We have to build these states. Therefore, we promote nationalism, not pan-Africanism. 
And there is a conflict between nationalism and Pan-Africanism. By nationalism, he meant, of course, the country nationalism, territorial nationalism. And so there's a dilemma. And I always said half jocularly that it was, it was his own dilemma. How do you negotiate between Pan-Africanism and nationalism? Because he was head of state. And how did he resolve that issue? Of course, he did not resolve. But he ended up by saying that you young people, unlike us, are still free. And you must carry on the torch of Pan-Africanism. Because to talk these days in terms of Ghanaian, Tanzanian, and Nigerian doesn't make sense. Because whether you like it or not, when you go out, you are recognized as Africans, not as Ghanaians, not as Tanzanians, not as Nigerians. So outside, they, 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 they recognize us as Africans. And that is what we should be doing inside, because we're oppressed as Africans, and we should liberate as Africans. So I think that is an important uh, observation. Okay. Uh, don't forget that uh, one of the very important uh, insights of Amilcar Cabra was the independence of Afro simply means to reclaim our Africanness. He said to reclaim our Africanness, to get back into history as Africans. So you can see the, the that, that, that identity, if I, may, if I may use that word, although I don't like it very much, of being Africans is, is very strong. And I think that is what we have to build on. That is what we have to build on. It is true that there are forces, obviously against it, not only internal forces who want to keep their narrow sovereignties for their own personal interests, for their own class interests, but also outside powers. Look, for example, let me, let me take the example of uh, uh, what has happened in West Africa. Those three countries, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso. Yes, right. They, 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 what is their move? To start a confederation, right? Yeah. And the inspiration of, of Thomas Sankara, who, who was a Pan-Africanist, okay, still has come back, has come back. So you can see that the Pan-Africanist sentiment, and hopefully thought and movement, has not simply died. But now, as uh, one of our philosophers said, we have to make Pan-Africanism the category of intellectual thought. The category of intellectual thought. And that's the, that's the road to, 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 to go down on the question of Pan-Africanism. Because as individual countries, as what Yari used to call stateless, we don't have much future in, this global, in the global world, right. where there are sort of very strong rivalries of imperialism. And today, don't forget that the imperialist powers have their eyes on Africa as one continent which still is left with resources. Okay. And now, both hot and cold wars are coming back on the continent. And the only way we can withstand that, the only way we can withstand the scramble for Africa and the plunder of Africa, even by pan Africanism. Now that you, you declare, at least you display clearly, that you're such an advocate of Pan-Africanism, does that explain why you've railed against the African Union, uh, which used to be the Organization of African Unity, so harshly? What do you think they could have done differently, um, this, the, these regional bodies? Yes, let me, let me say, don't forget, the establishment of the Organization of African Unity, 1963, was actually a compromise. You remember the famous debate of Kwame Nkrumah. Until the last moment, Kwame Nkrumah was not supporting OAU because he believed that what was needed was for the African countries to unite. And he had to be persuaded by the likes of Haile Selassie and so on before he agreed to the formation of Organization of African Unity. Uh, in 1997, 
on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Ghana independence, Nyerere made a speech, extemporaneous speech, where he said that uh, his generation set out to do two things. One was African liberation of the rest of the continent, which was still under the colonial yoke. They more or less succeeded with the 1994 uh, democratic change in South Africa. The second was African unity. On African unity, they had not succeeded. And now that was the work of the young people to continue the task of African unity. Yere also observed that OEU had turned into a trade union of African states. The leaders protected each other. So AU has not really kept the torch of uh, Pan-Africanism a light of burning. It has become a, an organization of, of, of states heavily dependent on foreign powers and look at its uh, policies that it adopts, how much it is swayed by the by, by strong powers and becoming part of a pawn in the chessboard of the geo geopolitics and uh, geopolitical struggles of imperialist, of imperialist countries. So both OAU and AU, in spite of some, some, some good, good uh, uh, events here and there, has not really fulfilled that, that, that role. So I think we have to, uh, rather than put all our eggs in one basket, rather than simply uh, believe that AU can carry on Pan-Africanism, why don't we must be, we should can give, give it critical support? But the people has to take their own initiative towards developing Pan-Africanist organizations and eventually, hopefully, Africa-wide Pan-African organizations. Let me now find out from you, um, in respect of your views on the West and their obsession with human rights, you're also passionate about human rights, but somewhat at some point it comes across as being condescending. Do you find this approach duplicitous? Is it still happening today? You remember Nkrumah said, uh, the final form of colonialism is neo-colonialism. Some say we are there already, but our approach as a continent in dealing or interacting with the Western world, specifically Western Europe and the United States, is it a fair one on the matter of human rights? Take, for example, the discussion on the LGBTQ um, you know, front and everything that has been said on the one end, and how it has been framed in the context of, if you don't go this way, you will not get aid, you will not get certain grants and all of that. What is your, your thinking on that? Look, in 1989, I published a book called The Concept of Human Rights in Africa. My basic argument was that human rights was an ideology. And it was an ideology in the arsenal of imperialist domination. Mm. At that time, we talked about double standards of human rights of the Western country. There are lots of examples. We even questioned who is, an Af who is a human being. Don't forget. African for the long time was not accepted as a human being. The two centuries of slave trade was the African was a chattel. Okay. So this proclamation of universality of human rights was very duplicitous, you know, and therefore I questioned about it. But I said that we have to, we have to reconfigure we have to put the so-called human rights discourse on its head and look at human rights from our own point of view and what are the important human rights. This was a discussion in 1989. At the time when the book came out, even in the people on the left thought that it was very demagogic. Okay? 
and it is not easily accepted, of course, by the human rights, so-called human rights community. But today, today, for example, after what happened in Libya, if you look at the, what, what the Western countries did in Libya, how can you hear from their mouths talk about human rights? Atrocious. The way they would trample on the very humanity. Okay? What they are doing today in Gaza, mm. genocide. How can these people talk about human rights? And how can we tolerate them to hear human rights lectures from them? These people who have destroyed the very humanity of ours, of the, of the people of the South. How can they talk about human rights? So I think, and, and the new introduction that I wrote to my book, which was recently relaunched by Codesia, the new edition, the second edition, I argue that we have to go beyond human rights talk. So we have to reclaim our humanity again okay? and root our humanity in our own thinking, in our own interests and in, in, in ourselves as Africans, as African communities. Now you raise the question LGBT. You know, Western countries have this uh, uh, have this fashion. They pick on one isolated thing, use it as a stick, use it as a wave against African countries. I believe that all human beings are equal. That's, that's the very basic elementary belief to start with. If you're talking about human rights, if you're talking about equal rights. All human beings are equal. Now, what does all human beings be equal mean? Nyerere explained it very well in one of his uh, very early essays. Equality of human beings is not equality of rights. It's not equality of opportunity. It's not that all human beings are born equal. No. They are equal in the humanity. They are equal in the humanness. And that applies to everyone, regardless of the race, color, tribe, origins, and regardless of the sexual orientation. Everyone, the humanity is equal, regardless of who they are, where they belong. So in that sense, I do not accept his arguments about discrimination or discriminating. Look, uh, some of the reactionary African leaders who argue against and pass laws against LGBT, okay, talk about African values and so on, which is not true, which is not actually true. In our societies, people with different sexual orientations were tolerated. It was never an issue. Mm. It was considered a private matter. It was not an issue. It was made an issue by Western powers who did not recognize different social orientations. And now that they have begun to recognize it, they're making it a big thing. But we always recognize, we always tolerated it in our societies. That's actually the correct history. Welcome back. This is The Sages on uh, Joy News, and we're still here with Professor Is Isa Shifji, and uh, he joins us for this conversation. We've been talking about leadership, Pan-Africanism, everything in between on the continent of Africa. But up next, I want to find out from you, someone who has been president, leader of your country, Tanzania, the fifth president, to be specific, and may he rest in peace, of course, uh, John Magufuli. Now, some view him as a sort of example on the continent of Africa in terms of leadership, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of the fight against corruption, in terms of that kind of leadership that uh, is, is diligent, respectful, and lives up to certain standards. The interesting point is that you disagreed 
uh, with, with some of that. I want you to tell us why and paint a picture for us, for example, whether someone in the mold of Paul Kagame is what fits the leadership uh, persona in Africa. So start with John Magufuli, yes, but Africa, Paul Kagame and the like, and, uh, you know, Magufuli. Is that what Africa needs? Okay, uh, very briefly, just a background to, 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 to Magufuli coming to power. After Mwalimu Yerele stepped down in 1985, our second president was Alias Mui for 10 years. I considered the Mui period as a transition between nationalism and neoliberalism. Mm. There was usual uh, 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 neoliberal prescriptions which were followed, opening up of markets, uh, allowing free trade, uh, inviting foreign investment, etc., etc. You know all that. Then came the 10th period of uh, President Kappa, 10 years of President Kappa. And he, in my view, consolidated neoliberalism, particularly on the privatization front. Because during his term, many parastatals were privatized. And uh, mining was given to South African capital and the Canadian capital in a big way. So it was a period of, in my view, consolidation of neoliberalism. But Nkapa still followed some of the party procedures because we still had one party system. So to a certain extent, the party still acted as a check on the government. After President Nkapa, we had 10 years of President Kikwete. That is to say from, 20, from 2005 to 2015. And uh, 10 years of President Kikwete were really what I would call rampant neoliberalism. It's almost a laissez-faire neoliberalism. There's hardly any check on the, on, on the government. Corruption increased, obvious corruption, conspicuous consumption increased, uh, capital, both local and foreign, did what they wanted through devious means, etc., etc. So we had one of the most uh, 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 rampant period of neoliberalism during those 10 years. And of course, this had devastating consequences on our society. It had devastating consequences on our society. Privatization of social sectors, like education, water, electricity, health, meant that many poor people had to go without these services. Mm. In other words, a very important element of wage, the social wage, was cut out. Poverty increased. And for the first time, in Tanzania, we began to notice, obviously, a great divide between the rich and the poor. And the rich lived lavish. They flaunted their wealth. Okay. Then in 2015, we get Magufuli. In my view, we started off well. In fact, I gave an interview on his 90 days. And I was quite uh, 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 favorable to some of his pronouncements. But I did raise my doubts critically whether he will be able to accomplish those. Okay, in summary, I would say Magufuli period was a backlash to neoliberalism. Mm. And this type of populist backlash has happened in many countries, not only in, in Tanzania. Maybe Zimbabwe? <laughs> Yes, Zimbabwe, the backlash to neoliberalism can be either a populist right or populist left. Both have problems. Both have problems. Because populism has a problem. 
Mabu fully presented himself as a Messiah. He had to come, he had to come to deliver the poor without the participation of the poor. He did some good things, some projects like railway, which I think was important, some of infrastructure projects, which are good, okay. Discipline in the bureaucracy, he definitely introduced. But through means which could obviously not be sustained, because it is a discipline born of fear, not born of any particular motivation. And besides all that, he had very little understanding of the international geopolitical situation. He took certain measures which became very popular in Tanzania and in Africa, but the outcomes were not always as expected. Like which one? For example, uh, the whole question of mining and the mining contracts. You know, so the so-called settlement that was made, all right, all those settlements actually, I'm told, have not been carried out. We never carried out, you see. Because this, uh, I mean, this, this mining companies are very manipulative, they know. They do not they want to leave Tanzania with a benefit from it. Okay? So now some of these things did not come out in the open. So on the one hand, you had certain measures which were, I think, positive, but on the other hand, he did not have a good understanding of imperialism and the way imperialism functions, number one. Number two, number two, which is also important, there was no accountability. There was no accountability, there was no check. In many ways, they must look small, but in many ways, Mago fully behaved as an emperor. Okay. So I think that's not what a leader who can sustain development, who can sustain meaningful participation of the people can be. Okay, so you, you, think, can... you, you think Magufuli strayed. When you look at the example, the other example of Paul Kagame, briefly, uh, it, it, is he cast in the mold of Magufuli? He stayed on for quite a while. Some say he's become uh, a bit of a despot. And, and you talk about an emperor. Uh, some would say that he's also cast in that uh, mold. W what, what is your take? Well, <laughs> I would say sort of uh, somewhat light, light tone is Magufuli who tried to cast himself in or Kagame's mold rather than the other way around. Uh, mm. Both actually, Magufuli and, 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 and Kagame were obsessed by security questions. Okay? And both countries, of course, it's difficult always to find hard evidence. Israel, spy agencies penetrated both states. And in my view, Kagame has not really broken away from imperialism. He's, yes. he's playing it one against another. And let us not forget both Kagame and Museveni's design of Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC. They were because of hell. Okay. So again, that kind of leader who has certain expansionist uh, ambitions on the one hand, an internal despotism on the other hand, you, you, you cannot really put them forward as a possible model for Africa. Sure, in the short run, there's sure certain things which are positive, but in, in my view, Without the people being in the center, without the participation of, of, the, of the people, this cannot be sustained. And you do not know when can they turn against the very people that are supposed to be uh, developing. Mm. And of course, you cannot talk about all of this leadership without talking about constitutionalism. 
as well, uh, or constitutions in different countries. We have our own constitution since 1992 here in Ghana, and some say some aspects of it, so to speak, are obsolete, do not currently reflect the aspirations of the people, which you would find in the constitution itself, the preamble. But for you, as a doyen, a scholar of constitutional law, remaining cautious about overplaying the role of constitutions. Some say that has been actually part of the problem in Africa, but you, you've been warning about being too legalistic. Uh, what would you proffer for Africa in that context? Uh, a sort of liberalism, not strict constitutionalism? What, what is it that you would proffer for Africa? Look, let us be clear. I think constitutions are important as primary documents which crystallize national consensus. So I do not want to dismiss the importance of constitutions, the centrality to constitutions. And constitutions as something which can act as a check on abuse of power. Having said that, I do not believe that anywhere in the world is constitutions which make a revolution. It's revolutions which make constitution. You can have best constitution in technical sense. I mean, South African constitution, Kenyan constitutions are very good. But what is the reality on the ground? Mm. The South Africa is one of the most unequal countries in the world. It's very high rates of employment. So constitutions by themselves, without basic social transformation, cannot take us very far. It is social transformation we should inform constitutions, not the other way around. That's number one. Number two, we have had long debate on the constitution in Tanzania, and I've participated in them since the 80s. Since the 80s. And I always argued that the argument for constitutional change is not to get a better constitution in technical sense, but is to get constitutions which would have legitimacy with the people, to get constitutions in which people have participated, and therefore people are prepared to defend it. And if I advocated long protected debates before you adopt a, a, a constitution, in other words, to build a national consensus on the Constitution. Now, that is not, that is not the paradigm. It's not a liberal paradigm. It's a more popular paradigm. But our Constitutions are cast in a liberal paradigm. And I think that is where the problem lies. So while I don't dismiss Constitutions, I don't believe that you can build so-called liberal constitutions or neoliberal economics. Those constitutions do not work and cannot get legitimacy with the people. Right. For example, most of our constitutions do not talk about the most fundamental problems of the people. What kind of society do they want? What are the issues on the question of land, for example? What does the constitution tell us about these things? These are the concerns, daily concerns of the people. Employment, these are the concerns of the people. Education, these are the concerns of the people. Okay. So I think it's important for us to think of constitutions in a, in, in a mode which is different from liberal constitutions, but in a much more in a popular people's sense. Right. And let me just take you back a little bit to your study of the law and what you've used it for. It strikes me because you engaged in legal aid, uh, offering your services to pastoralists, peasants, among others, uh, the poor, the downtrodden in society. Uh, something that you wouldn't find a lot of in many parts of Africa. It's, it's become pretty commercial. What lessons are inherent in that for the legal practice and 
sanitizing it? Yes. You know, the legal practice that we have, many African countries, of course, is a, is, is, is a, we have inherited from the from colonial powers. It's very elitist. And in many ways, it really serves the status quo. You don't think of law as something uh, which is transformative. It is actually very much part of the status quo to maintain the status quo. Law mystifies reality. I think it's a great invention of the bourgeoisie, law. Law both presents itself as doing justice while actually mystifying injustices and inequities in society. Okay? Now, legal aid that we are doing to uh, uh, driving forces. One was that while we talked a lot about the people at the university, we are essentially petty bourgeois. We essentially belong to some kind of elite group, a privileged group. How do you actually build context, blood and flesh context with ordinary people? And we thought legal aid would be the way to make that, to build that bridge with the people. And I think we did that. We did that. Legal aid became, in Tanzania, as a faculty of law, became very popular with the people. That's number one. Number two, in spite of what we, the analysts would say about law, people still have some faith in it. They think that, that is where they can get justice. Because that is what they've been brought upon. Now, you cannot then tell the people that no, you won't get justice there. Okay. They have to go through it and come to the realization themselves that they have to go beyond law because law doesn't do justice. Legal justice is not the same thing as social justice. So that's where the debate is. And there's another driving force behind our doing uh, legal aid in, in, in Tanzania. So for 10 years I was involved in very vigorous legal aid. And I think it made a dent uh, so long as it was an uh, initiative of the, of the law faculty. But since then, legal aid has been taken over by the governments, is taken over by NGOs, the funding agencies, and it has lost that, that, uh, that vision, that vision, uh, not only of service, but also of uh, uh, demystifying law and bringing in the public domain issue of social justice. Mm. Now, at the start of our conversation, I made mention of the fact that you're an author, and you also made mention of the fact that of the 18 books you have penned, not all of them are academic. You have a bit of a, I wouldn't say curious, but an exquisite, a unique writing style. And some have even compared your writing style on social issues and other matters to poetry. You have disagreed with them, but what do you think makes this striking literary technique come to bear? Is it natural? Is it learned? Is it a fusion of so many things in your life? What is it that, that comes out in your writing style? Actually, I know you need to thought. I, I, I write what I feel I should write. And I write. <laughs> so you go with the so flow. I have never given any thought to technique and so on, both literary style, etc. But yes, uh, I always hit with passion. I have not written things for the sake of writing. I have written things for, because I feel passionate about the topics on which I write. Uh, and I mean, that's all I would say about my writing. I don't think there's a particular writing style that I've adopted. Uh, but some have said that my writing style is very dogmatic, for example. That it's not objective, and etc. So I said, well, that is it. I am passionate about what I write. That's all. And my passion is for the interests of and for the justice of the common people, for the ordinary folks. Now, 
it's also been said that, yes, you have a certain serious demeanor, but that you're also pretty humorous, that you are rather funny. But it's a side that not many would get to see unless they, they get pretty close to you. How do you maintain all of this, the balance between work, uh, your writing, and your academic pursuits? I know you are a professor emeritus, but how do you, in the midst of all of this, relax, rewind, re-energize? How, how do you do that? Well, you are telling me this. I don't know myself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know myself. In fact, the only time I felt that there was somehow and a different demeanor, who usually was when a friend of mine was visiting, you know, and I had a bit of laughing loud, you know, I think which is very common among us, you know, we, we don't hide our laughter, you know, we laugh as much as we. So when I laugh, you know, he suddenly told me, he said, do you know, you laugh, you, you, you laugh with your shoulders. <laughs> Until then, I never realized that I laugh with my shoulders. <laughs> well, you know, these things are something that, uh, you never think about. You never think about. And really it's very difficult to attribute them to any particular factors. And I would not even break my head over it. Mm. That's what I am. And hopefully that's what I'll continue to be. Well, I'll tell you what. When you just laughed a little bit there, you did laugh with your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's that, you know. <laughs> there, there you go again. Maybe my final bit before I, I take your final words, especially as we think about Africa. I want you to contemplate the young people in Africa uh, who will take the mantle of leadership, who will become the next Shivjis and uh, the next academics and the next legal luminaries and all that. Your stance is that the people matter, that people, not states, not constitutions, as we've spoken about constitutionalism, and markets, the people from whom sovereignty is derived should be primus inter pares, the most important uh, in the equation, not governments and all of that. But what can leadership apply from that thinking? Focus on the people. It, it takes you back to Lincoln's, uh, you know, that famous bit about a government of the people, by the people, for uh, the people, in terms of democracy. What do you think can be done to change the tide in Africa with a focus on the people, the hoi polloi? Yeah, you know, it reminds you of one anecdote. Uh, once Omnikar Cabral, I think he was visiting one of the Western capitals, and he was asked, by a participant in the audience, he says that you are talking about guerrilla war in your country, but you know, we know that one of the important uh, landscape and terrain for guerrilla war is mountains. But there are no mountains in your country, in Guinea Bissau. And Kabbalah said, people are our mountains. People are our mountains. So that is where people matter. It's not a terrain, it's not a particular atmosphere, it's how people participate, how people fully are involved. And I think that is one, that is one aspect where our leadership in Africa, not only in Africa, many countries, has, has totally failed. Because you always looked upon people as illiterate, as people who do not know where to be led, where to be educated, etc. But we are not prepared to learn from people. We who consider ourselves educated, who will educate us if not the people? So it is people who should educate us, we should learn from people. And we refuse to do that. As Yare would say, we don't have our ears on the ground, many of our leaders. So they don't know. For example, in Kenya, in Kenya, the leadership did not know that the volcano was boiling and was likely to erupt. And it erupted. Eight men erupted. Okay? We have seen what happened in Kenya. And this 
young people, what they call themselves Generation Z, Gen Z, they, they, they were not led by the political party. Their demands, their organization, which was amazing, went beyond tribes, which is so, such an important uh, uh, dividing factor of the, of the ruling classes in Kenya, went beyond it, beyond it, you know. So, when volcanoes erupt, when people are oppressed for a long time, you know, what does not happen over centuries happens within days. Okay? I remember the famous uh, book by, I think, I forget the name now, the Russian Revolution, Seven Days That Shook the World. Mm. So what has not been happening over centuries happens within days. And that's what happened in Kenya. What is happening in Kenya? So, and, and in that sense, it's not an exception. It actually is showing us what is the, what is the future of many of other East African countries. Because we all are sort of, you know, lying on our laurels. One of the important issues in Kenya was, of course, question of unemployment of the young people, which is endemic in many African countries. Another was that, okay, which again is endemic in Africa. My own countries is borrowing left, right, and center. And you know what that means? That means that to service the debts, you spend more of your tax on servicing the debt than you spend on education, health, agriculture combined. Okay? That, that is, it is a basically new form of slavery. That's what debt is. It's a new form of slavery. And those who benefit from it, from, uh, from it always lead us into that trap or that trap. Right. And that allows them to hold us in their hands. That restricts our freedom. And yet we follow, we, 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 we borrow, we borrow. In other words, we are mortgaging our countries, our resources. That's what that means. Right. And these things are enemies. And that's one of the big issues, uh, big issues in, in, in Kenya. The other one is opulence. Such filthy opulence, obscene opulence. Of the sort of leaders of ours, you know, they say that they do not have money to improve the health system, but they spend millions of shillings and billions of shillings on 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 on, on luxury cars for the ministers and for the leaders. How do you, how do we justify that? How do we justify that? You know, so I'm saying. The, the volcano, the pot is boiling everywhere in Africa. We do not know when it will erupt. And I'm wondering whether the so-called leaders in Africa will, will learn a lesson from Kenya. But Kenya has a lot to teach. What happened over those two weeks, there's a lot to teach. Kenya has a lot to teach and hopefully our leaders will learn. Before we let go of you, it's been quite the conversation. It's been, uh, it's given us a lot of food for thought. And I hope that those who will watch this conversation will, will sit down and ponder a whole lot when it comes to our continent and where we are headed. But before you take leave of us, in a minute or less, what will be your parting words for us? My parting words would be the future of Africa, once again, is first Pan-Africanism, second Pan-Africanism, third Pan-Africanism. That's our future lives. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that has been our conversation. Hopefully you enjoyed it with author, academic, uh, very generous spirit and a man known for his intellectual capacity, both in the law and as far as development is uh, concerned. A man whose thoughts uh, hopefully will resonate through time and give lessons for all of us to learn from, especially our leaders. Professor Isa Gulam Hussein Shifji. He joined us today in that hot seat on The Sages. My name is Benjamin Akako. Thank you for watching. Thank you.